As you uh, click through the, the various slides uh, that, that uh, form this presentation, um, I, I hope you'll get a, a really good feel for how the school is moving forward for um, this concept of learning without limits. I would just like at this point to thank the, uh, the staff at Durrington High School in uh, West Sussex uh, on which our work has been uh, founded. Um, and we look forward to working both closely with them and with parents as we continue to develop this scheme. The removal of national curriculum levels has taken place simply because actually the, the work in schools has predominantly been about uh, the chasing of, of levels and not so much actually the knowledge and the skills that, that actually were, were felt to be uh, beneficial. They were introduced in, in 1988 and they were always intended to be used as an end of key stage, so an end of year nine uh, uh, opportunity to, to assess students. Unfortunately, what they became was uh, a chasing of each individual sublevel, where it became about the chasing of the next sublevel and then the next sublevel, rather than actually identifying where students necessarily were uh, deficient or had a gap that needed to be closed in their understanding. So in fact, uh, what, what it became, um, because of the best fit nature of the, of the levels, was uh, a mask to where students actually uh, had an issue. So uh, an overall figure, let's say, for example, in maths might be given as a, a level five, um, but actually a student may not be able to do algebra whilst they might actually be able to do uh, area. But because it's a one level approach, it sort of masked that. And it was felt really that removing the levels would give schools an opportunity to focus back on the knowledge and the skills and actually determining whether where students were, were at uh, um, uh, in a more uh, sensible approach. The recent Commission on Assessment by John McIntosh CBE reported in uh, September 2015 that schools were free to choose uh, assessment methods and recapture the link between what was taught and what was assessed in order to identify the gaps that students had in their knowledge or their skill base. Using uh, this concept, Nobel has been moving forward on its work with particularly Year 7 curriculum and how it's assessed. Until recently, there was a rather fixed mindset approach where students of a particular Key Stage 2 type uh, would be expected to achieve certain things at GCSE. A 4 at Key Stage 2 often meant a C at GCSE. And this rather fixed the outcomes for students in many cases. Um, it, it, at Nobel, uh, more recently, uh, this approach uh, has been uh, uncoupled um, and we'd really like to to call the opportunity to work without levels really learning without limits encouraging students and helping them supporting them to believe that they can go actually as far as they wish to go depending on how much effort and motivation they have when we started this new piece of developmental work we we spoke to staff and and said look what is it we want to achieve um, staff were clear that actually they wanted there to be no limits to the learning for any individual student and, and a, apply the concept that just because um, a student didn't know something um, didn't mean they would never uh, know or be able to do that thing. So we call this the not yet mentality. Um, I, I, I can't do it yet as opposed to I can't do it ever. We also made the determination to, to measure students less and feed them more, um, encouraging more academic knowledge and, and skills to be taken on board by students by the fact that we had more time to actually get those, those, not, that, that, those sets of knowledge and skills into students rather than spend our time measuring how much uh, every small increment uh, dif difference had made. Um, we as the staff said that we wanted to not use national curriculum levels anymore and, and we also wanted to make sure that where we identified gaps we actually got students to master and, and, and fill any gaps in knowledge and skills before moving on to the next stage. 
Of course, setting about rewriting complete curriculum is, is quite a daunting task. Um, and, and as a staff, we wanted to make it manageable, which is why we've actually started with year seven and we will roll through years eight and nine so that we complete the whole of Key Stage three during the course of the next year. Um, but we wanted to make sure that what we delivered at the end of year nine was students that were GCSE ready. Um, so the task for, for all of the faculties was to determine what skills and knowledge were actually needed um, to deliver students that would be sex successful at uh, GCSE. Um, um, and we did this by working backwards from, from uh, year nine um, and saying what did year nine students need to be successful to move on and, and if they needed that then what actually did we need in year eight and so on into, into year seven. Um, so, so we've decided w what is it that we value and that students would need in order to be successful. Uh, and that's the way that we've planned the, the curriculum for year seven. With the removal of national curriculum levels as one scale from low uh, to high, uh, it gives schools the opportunity to, uh, to increase motivation for students and to report on students of different abilities that are actually making expected progress at the point at which they happen to be working. So we've introduced this idea of training groups. Um, training groups really, in concept, is really no different to imagining if two different sets of people might be training for a half marathon and some might be fitter th than others at, the, at the, the starting point. So if I was running, uh, dare I suggest that I might be running a little bit slower than some of my fitter and younger colleagues. Now they might try and train together and I might train with the people who were posting times which are similar to my own. But as I was uh, more motivated, put more effort in, got fitter, posted faster times, I'd then start to train with people who again were getting fitter at the same time. Now academically we see this as, as no different in, in concept, um, but actually we want to be able to praise somebody for, for academically, um, for, for doing well at the particular aspect that they're working, uh, level that they're working at. So training groups uh, is a way, of, a way of doing this and whilst we put students in a particular training group at the beginning of their, of their, of their year, as they get fitter academically, uh, we would want them to, to move up uh, during the course of Key Stage 3 so that they actually go as far as they are able to, um, learning without limits. So not actually having a predetermined outcome for a student just because they arrive with a particular Key Stage 2 uh, set of results. In essence, this means that a student in any of our training groups could be making expected progress, good progress, or even exceptional progress. Um, or they could be not yet, where we're identifying gaps for improvement. Any student that's, that's exhibiting exceptional progress would then be moved up to the next training group, where again they could make expected progress, good, exceptional, or even not, not yet. Um, but the principle is that anybody at any point on, on their, their journey could be making expected progress. Um, this is both motivational and allows us to, to reward students for the progress that they're making at that point. So on the left of this slide you can see each of the four uh, training groups that I've been describing and each of them in each different year group has a different set of knowledge and skills, although that knowledge and skills may be uh, similar and uh, it, the students would actually be taught uh, in the main in the same uh, teaching group. Um, teachers have always done this, we've always differentiated work uh, through task and, and outcome um, and, and it would be no different in just because of the introduction of the, the training groups. Um, in, as they roll through the year, students obviously make progress and where gaps become identified um, or, or during the course of the, the latter stages of the year where actually we want students to be ready for the next year, uh, year seven become year eight ready, uh, interventions take place. So not only through the year, but at the end of the year, where we can make the difference before they move on to the next step. Um, this principle of, of not yet um, is, is about trying to get students uh, to believe and um, with that belief um, make sure that they're su supported in order to, to make their the right next steps. Clearly being honest about the training groups is, is very important, uh, primarily because we wouldn't want a student to get to the end of year nine thinking that they could opt for, um, let's say, triple science, which is um, a very academic subject, um, which um, they weren't able to because they've been in, in a lower training group. 
So although a student can make expected progress, um, if they finish the key stage and remain in, let's say, foundation group training group, then actually th there may be a more limited uh, series of options available to them. So by being honest, what we, we hope is that we can motivate um, and support students to rise up through the training groups so that actually the not yet's become expected, expected's become good and then, and then to exceptional performance. Um, it, it, it's important to, to, to note that we wouldn't want any parent to, to make the assumption that expected progress all the way through key stage three um, in a lower, found a, a lower training group uh, actually meant that, that students could opt for whatever they, they wished. Clearly, it's in our interest to make sure that students are on appropriate Key Stage 4 courses and are going to be successful in those courses. Um, what we do hope to be able to do, though, is to motivate and get students to believe that actually the, the efforts that they put in will lead to um, a, a better set of outcomes in the end. Um, and that they have a huge part to play in that alongside the support that, uh, that, and the teaching and learning that they receive from staff. So as I've explained previously, on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see Key Stage 2 results and CATs help inform a starting point for us in terms of a student's training group. Um, alongside this, uh, the faculty areas then assess and baseline test students as they've entered the school in Year 7. Um, and they did finally determine the training group uh, in every given faculty area. One might expect a student to be different, let's say, um, in a maths training group compared to a PE training group, potentially, although that doesn't have to be the case. After this, the, um, the different learning zones take place across the year. Now, although there are two major learning zones, learning zone one and learning zone two, after which there are data drops uh, that are posted online for parents, um, there's assessment taking place within the teaching and learning uh, throughout and although learning zone one is a is a is a period of time actually there could be numerous modules in any one given subject or all, all of which are, are marked and assessed to inform where where the staff where gaps are and uh, where gaps need to be closed um, the data drop information uh, on on both occasions will go on the the VLE, but but nothing really should be a shock to a parent if a student is repeatedly not yet. <coughs> we, excuse me. We would expect um, the parents to be uh, informed about this and in, and dialogue between the home and school. So when a student gets towards the uh, end of the year, they're then of course um, tested with robust uh, exams and end of year exams. And these have become increasingly important for all year groups. Now the reason why they're important, twofold, they, uh, they support uh, the identification of any further gaps through, through testing, they inform parents, um, and of course, um, to the, the school, they're, they're a check and a balance on the judgments that are made during the course of the year um, so that the, the, the school can then uh, develop this whole concept. Now because all faculties are, are different and deliver a variety of sets of knowledge and, and skills we felt it was important to make sure that the faculties had control over uh, some of the judgments that we were making. I mean uh, to, to, to me uh, it's fairly clear what expected progress is. It means that if we've identified a particular set of knowledge and skills for a particular training group, that students have demonstrated that they've acquired those knowledge and skills. And if they haven't yet, then clearly they're not yet. They've not yet demonstrated that they've acquired those skills. It's the two uh, the criteria above for, for good progress and exceptional progress that we've left in the hands of the faculties. I mean, it's important that, that the decisions about the and nuances of, of different subjects are, are made by the subject specialists. And although uh, the good band may be uh, slightly smaller or, or um, the exceptional band slightly smaller it's up to faculties to make those judgments um, and that's important because at the end of the year what we want to be able to say is that students that are making uh, exceptional progress um, really do uh, then need to move up in their their training group uh, so so this particular aspect is in the hands of the faculties and of course will be uh, constantly reviewed so that we're getting the balance right of those students that are staying uh, put in a training group and those that are moving upwards so at the end of a learning zone period, uh, parents would expect to see a progress report um, online on the VLE um, along the lines of the one that's shown on, on the slide here. 
and we're, we're still trying to develop this uh, but this is the sort of information that we'd make available uh, to parents along along with behavior and uh, 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 rewards and uh, attendance um, all of which are extremely important and, and impact on the progress of, of students throughout but in essence what there would be was it would be a, a, a subject uh, a column um, an indication of which training group the student was in in that subject and the, the level of progress that they, they were making in that particular training group at this particular point in time. Obviously behaviour column and the concern codes which we've uh, always been uh, using um, and that will always be uh, uh, defined in the documentation that parents receive. And then additionally subject tar targets. These are particularly important in the not yet uh, subjects. Um, because they will highlight the aspect that students actually need to work on in order to uh, make uh, expected progress or, or better. Um, in addition to this, although this will happen twice a, a year and there will be marks from the exams, um, parents can also look forward to um, a form tutor report at the end of the year which pulls together the sort of pastoral development of a student um, and we'll, we'll probably also, in addition, focus on their progress towards becoming um, a Nobelian. And the Nobelian scheme obviously caters for a whole load of, of challenges and, and tasks, which we feel are really important if we're going to develop well-rounded uh, young people that go out into society with more than just academic qualifications to, to offer. Um, so I hope this uh, helps with some understanding about the school's direction. Clearly it's a, a scheme, um, the, the whole learning uh, without limits is a scheme which we're, we're developing all of the time. And I hope to be able to put updates for parents uh, here um, during the course of the coming year. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for dipping into this presentation. This is uh, Barry Burning, Deputy Head at Nobel School.